most of the content you'll find on my channel tries to celebrate how important Sega was to me while I was growing up. While I do cover some bad games here and there, the majority of what you find is very much worth playing. Not so in this episode. This time I'm going to cover the absolute worst games on the Sega Genesis. This list is very personal. I either wasted hard-earned money on them at retail, was stupid enough to give up a game in trade for them, or I rented them for a weekend of pain and suffering. These games look terrible, sound terrible, play terrible, and have little in the way of redeeming qualities. So powerful is my hatred for this group, I absolutely refuse to stain my gaming collection with their presence. I hope you guys enjoy my least favorite Sega Genesis game. I was actually a fan of the Batman Forever movie, so when I read that Acclaim was making a beat-em-up with digitized graphics and giving it Mortal Kombat style gameplay, I was all in. But man did things go horribly wrong in the process. It was developed by Probe Entertainment and released in September of 1995, with full Sega 6-button controller support on a very decent sized 24 megabit cart. Despite the setup for a great game, it all falls to pieces the moment you take control. While Batman has numerous attacks, none of them feel good when actually trying to use them against the enemies. Nothing connects with any real force. Jump kicks feel weak and ineffective. Getting caught between two enemies and getting batted back and forth only adds to the frustration. There's also a pile of platforming to do, and it's the kind that has you falling back down to the lower levels, only to try again with the same result. The visuals are piss poor too. The kind of dithered, low-color trash that defined a number of the late 16-bit titles. Acclaim wasn't known for a super high-quality stable of games, but this was beneath even their usual dreck. A beat-em-up with Mortal Kombat gameplay sounds great for a Batman game, but this one swung for the fences and came away with nothing but strikeouts. <laughs> Video games were no stranger to weird licenses that made no sense at all. In August of 1993, the Genesis got Wayne's World, a platform-heavy running gun based on the Saturday Night Live skit and movie starring Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. Being just 18 at the time, I of course loved the source material and figured the game deserved a look. Good night was I wrong. Right from the opening, you are treated with some heinously ugly storyboards trying to give you the feel of their public access show. This leads straight into jumping around terribly designed stages and constantly being bombarded with ear-grating voice samples and sound effects. They repeat over and over to the point of nausea. THQ knew it was so bad they only bothered releasing it in the United States. I actually set out to capture this one long enough to show you a few different levels but I just couldn't take more than a few minutes of it before I had to cut it off. Rarely has a game so completely overwhelmed me so quickly to give up on it, an effect that is still as potent today as it was 27 years ago. Sega was still developing Genesis titles well into the life of the Saturn, and Experts was one of those releases in June of 1996. It was meant to be a spin-off of Eternal Champions, but you wouldn't know it outside of being told that today. It's a side-scrolling beat-em-up with adventure and strategy elements. You have full control over a three-person counter-terrorist team and can switch between them at any point. You must infiltrate the base, use each one's skills and weapons to navigate various obstacles and enemies, and save the day. The back of the box makes it all sound so cool, even trumping up claims you can have different effects on the game world depending on your decisions. Problem is, the game plays like complete dog shit and you'll see precious little of these interesting bits because you'll be fumbling around with the atrocious gameplay. I don't really need to say much more in detail. I mean, just look at the screen and you can tell it doesn't play well. 
Making things worse is the fact that the entire base you have to explore all looks the same. So it's really easy to get lost, and you have to face the bad guys again and again, trapped in a rotation of tedium that quickly destroys your will to play it. I admire the attempt at huge pre-rendered characters, but man did Sega miss the mark here by a mile. Secondary mission active. Sometimes a bad game is made worse by technical shortcomings, and that definitely describes 1993's Awesome Possum here. Developed by Tengen and meant to be a clear ripoff of Sonic, you star as an eco-friendly possum who sets out to clean up the environment and educate you at the same time. The problem starts at the fundamental core of the engine itself. It's choppy, and I mean the kind of choppy that utterly ruins 2D gameplay. It feels as if the software is struggling to run frame to frame, and is on the verge of a complete lockup at any second. To make matters worse, the momentum feels completely unnatural. Whereas Sonic needed some speed to get up higher slopes, you easily move across every type of terrain here so fast, you wind up running into enemies constantly. This becomes incredibly tiresome in the later stages where it becomes a chore to avoid anything, thanks to enemies, traps, and pit deaths everywhere. This game is so bad it makes other wannabe Sonic clones like Bubsy seem like masterpieces. The excellent voice samples are the lone redeeming feature of this otherwise terrible experience. It was never released in PAL territories. Man, did I love all three of the Back to the Future films. The adventures of Doc Brown and Marty McFly were well worthy of a game of its own, but the 1991 Genesis release failed in every conceivable way. You have probably heard about this game's difficulty, and it's true it's pretty hard, but it's actually the poor stage design and even worse gameplay that makes it that way. You get no chance to become familiar with anything in the game before one-hit deaths begin to assault you. You'll restart numerous times before you actually get used to this garbage enough to get anywhere. Once you do, it only brings more pain. Some stages have things that can kill you and you have no clue why until you die so many times, you finally see what it is that's killing you. The graphics are also unusually dark, and that's saying something for a Genesis game. The thing is, it's actually a really short game, making you realize that the absurd difficulty and the design that enables it was meant to artificially extend your playtime. In other words, the developers knew they had a really short, really shitty game, so they cranked up the cheap deaths to make you feel like you got your money's worth. This was developed by Probe Software and published by Arena Entertainment, two companies intricately tied to acclaim. Double Dragon has a long and storied history of being really decent 8-bit home titles, but man did things go south when the series made its way to the Genesis. Every one of them sucked, but Double Dragon 3 here takes the crown of King of Sucking. It was released in 1993 by Flying Edge, or what was basically a claim. This was a port of the arcade original with a bunch of stuff missing or just outright broken. The most egregious of these is the truly punishing gameplay. There are so many things wrong with it, it's difficult to pick a starting point. The hitboxes are all wrong, there's no stun animation for the bad guys, the damage inflicted on you is unreal, and every enemy attack reaches further and is more potent than your own. Weapons are utterly useless, the shop system provides no help at all, and the only time you can actually do any damage is when your invincible frames are flashing after you've gotten knocked down. That means in order to actually kill anything, you have to take damage yourself. I had disliked Double Dragon 1 and 2 on the Genesis for various reasons, but good god is this one so much worse. It really is a shame too because they got the sound and graphics quite respectable. 
On a platform of beat-em-ups as strong as the Streets of Rage series, this kind of second-rate, unsatisfying, and abysmal effort simply had no place. This was a claim trying to capitalize on Sega's success in the West by flooding the market with so much garbage, they figured they'd sell some of it just because it existed. It's no wonder they're no longer around. The story behind the release of Slaughter Sport is more interesting than the game itself. It was developed at a time when Activision was going through significant financial troubles and restructuring, which meant a US release was initially cancelled. It was finally picked up again by Razorsoft, who brought it over a year after the Japanese version. That dedication to see it released would make you think it was totally worth your time, but you'd be dead wrong. This complete shitfest of a one-on-one -on -one fighter is one of the most broken, infuriating, and unplayable messes I've ever had the displeasure of wasting time with. You are trapped in Mandu's Fight Palace and must do battle to the death, and death is what you'll receive plenty of. Nothing here works at all. The one-on-one -on -one battles actually allow you to have your back to an opponent, and you need to turn around to face them. Get knocked down, you get up with your back to them. Awesome. Attacks have no rhyme or reason as far as what lands and what doesn't. Your opponents can actually walk through so many of your moves that it seems like the engine itself is just straight up broken. Fights quickly devolve into just mashing buttons and a frantic effort to try and do some kind of damage, but the AI is much better than you at actually scoring hits. People talk often about bad fighting games. You don't know what a truly bad fighting game is until you play this steaming heap of garbage. Sword of Sodan is an infamous 1990 release for the Genesis that kind of reminds you of a golden axe with much bigger sprites and lots of blood. I bet you ask yourself, are people too harsh on this game? Can a little bit of time and effort make it better? Absolutely not. Any of the time you spend in this game is akin to being kicked in the nuts and then asking for another kick immediately after. Utterly shite gameplay from the moment the game starts moving. Every animation looks so unnatural, like it's being played with mannequins, and the stage design is just of the worst type. Sometimes you get stuck having to deal with enemies and stage traps together, a brutal and off-putting combination that sees spikes constantly harming you, but going right through the bad guys with no trouble. Want to turn around and defend your flank from enemies behind you? You need a button to do it. Imagine for a moment if you needed a button to turn around in Golden Axe, Streets of Rage, or Shadow Dancer. Who in the hell thought that was a good idea? The final topping on this disaster is that your attacks go right through half the enemies with no damage registering at all. You can swing for the fences on some of these guys and never make contact, despite your weapon clearly touching them. It has a potion system in place to make you stronger and give you various power-ups, but who cares about this kind of depth when a game is so fundamentally broken on every other level? I mean this blight of a game doesn't even have music to play to. EA released some bad games on the Genesis, but stuff like this made you wonder how the same company could also have been responsible for games like Road Rash. Man, did I love me some Terminator 2 when I was a kid. I remember sitting in the theater with my buddies watching it and loving it so much we went right back to watch it again. So when a game was coming out based on this incredible action flick, it had to be good, right? Nope. Flying Edge and Acclaim strike again. Released in late 1993, this side-scrolling action title sounds like it got everything right on paper. You control the Schwarzenegger have access to both melee attacks and firearms, and must do battle with the T-1000. But everything goes into the toilet right away. 
Your melee attacks are weak and ineffective. Why is a Terminator having to hit guys three times to take them down? I mean, the creators surely watched the movie, right? Where in that opening scene did it appear that the T-800 had any trouble handling those bikers? Okay, I found John Connor's address, what do I do now? Find the future devices? What the heck is a future device? This is the part where you get to wander around stages looking for little boxes that contain some inexplicable item that has no bearing on the story whatsoever. It's simply a collectible put there to extend gameplay. While you search for these, enemies keep spawning everywhere, which means you are constantly taking damage in a game that gives you one single life. There's also an overhead drivable map where you have to find the next target. These play terrible and it's possible to get stuck and unable to move, forcing you to wait until other cars crash into you and free you. It doesn't matter because you won't get very far before you grow sick of killing the same cops, bikers, and that damn T-1000 for the millionth time. That's right, man. Those bikers back at the bar were so pissed, they followed you to the other stages. The gameplay here is poor but functional. It's actually the stage design and setup that completely collapses the fun factor. Searching areas for items that don't matter while being absolutely flooded with enemies that keep reappearing will send you straight for the power button after only a few levels. Of all the games we have looked at in this episode, Dark Castle holds a special place in my heart of absolute hatred. Few times have I played a game this bad. The visuals are poor, the sound is irritating beyond belief, and the gameplay truly stands apart as its own special layer in hell. Released in 1991, this is sort of a platformer mixed with adventure elements. You must find your way through various stages that consist mainly of jumping to platforms and climbing ropes while enemies try and stop you. The gameplay is a complete hindrance here, however. Just throwing rocks to defend yourself is a chore, and there are actually areas in the floor you can trip on and fall. That's correct. Trip and fall in a platformer. Enemies are way faster than you, you can't fall more than a few inches without dying, and the hit detection is way, way outside your sprite. But the developers weren't content with just making the game difficult and unfun to play, they also had to add what are some of the most annoying and rage-inducing sound effects I've ever heard in a video game. While you are on that 556th death, nothing beats enemies taunting you with ear-piercing voiceovers. EA was responsible for releasing this, another early game of dubious quality they picked up from the computer market. Had Electronic Arts stayed on this path, they would have ended up like a claim in THQ, almost certainly. Finding a Genesis title worse than this one is no easy task. Growing up in the 90s, I of course knew about Captain Planet and the Planeteers. It was an animated show about a group of kids that could use their powers to stop evildoers from destroying the Earth. When things got too tough, they could call Captain Planet to do the heavy lifting. Unfortunately, in this piss-poor Mega Drive effort released in 1993, you were stuck as the kids for 80% of the game. At the start, you get the choice of which kid to play as, each with various tasks to complete their levels. Some of them simply need to destroy certain machines to move on, others have to search for things like valves to shut off. There is a boss fight at the end of each stage, and once you get to the fifth and final level, you play as Captain Planet himself. Unfortunately, I have never seen the dude because playing this shit fest of a game grows tiresome quickly. The gameplay is functional enough, but the level design is just awful. A few stages are so short and simple they're over in minutes, while others are massive, sprawling areas that you easily get lost in. 
the graphics all look the same too, so landmarks to guide you are few and far between. Hit detection is poor, and the jumping mechanic has a funky delay to it that feels imprecise. Then there are the ear-shattering sound effects. Holy hell, man. You think you know bad gym sound? Think again. The sound effects here will have you reaching for the volume control in mere seconds. The game has a few difficulty settings that range from making it really hard to making it a cakewalk, so little kids may find some appeal here. It was done by Nova Logic for Sega, the same company that did the truly abysmal Blackfire on the Sega Saturn. This was not officially released in the US. One of the most peculiar licenses on the Genesis was 1994's The Incredible Crash Dummies. Flying Edge published it, who of course is just a claim, and it of course turned out to be as bad as you expected. Grey Matter developed it, the team behind Wayne's World on the Genesis, and the Crow City of Angels on the Saturn. I mean I could stop right there and not say another word and you should know the kind of shit stain you have on your hands. The mere concept of the gameplay here is infuriating. The developers basically said let's take our gameplay, which isn't fun or well executed, and make it even worse by causing the player to lose body parts as you take damage. So as you run and jump through this mess, things are falling on you every few inches, enemies come out of nowhere, and the stage design is a convoluted mess. Best part was though is as you struggled with the floaty and slippery platforming you also got to do it without arms and legs, taking an already sad experience and making you not want to even play it. The visuals aren't bad but the music and sound effects suck to high heaven, so there's little here to motivate you to see more than a stage or two. There were some bad fighting games released during the booming days of Street Fighter 2 and its spin-offs, but few could compete with the bland and poorly executed Rise of the Robots released in 1995. It starts out promising enough, the CD-like intro looks amazing and sets the game up potentially as having some incredible animation with the 32 megabit cart size. You can let those dreams die quickly however, because you are immediately thrust into a fighting engine that is just plain broken. No coherent combo system to speak of, hit detection seems random, and every damn move is just a sped up version from weak to strong. Best part is, is that as you get your ass whooped trying to learn it, a death sends you back to the title screen. That's right newcomers, be prepared to play the first two or three guys about ten times before you find that one move to spam the hell out of and finally see the end. Some folks like to commend the graphics, but I think those look like shit too. It lacks any sort of real artistic flair, and most of what's on screen is sterile and colorless. Acclaim could release some bad stuff, but this thing deserves a class action so every customer could see a full refund. I truly do feel for you if it was a gift for you when you were a kid. I have spoken ill of Fantasia in the past and I'll do so here again to make sure as many people as possible avoid this turd originally published in 1991. After Sega released Castle of Illusion, I was expecting another decent Mickey game in this one, but it really fell short of my expectations. Most of the problems begin with the gameplay, which has sort of an animation lag that makes sudden moves quite difficult. That basically means until you learn every enemy placement and platforming segment, death will come frequently and without mercy. But the developers decided to take the frustration a little further by putting in garbage like multiple exit points that can actually lead you back to repeating a stage. I mean if there ever was a despicable practice to make your game artificially long, that's it. The sad part is, is that there's actually some killer visuals here. I love some of the later stage graphics and if it had the proper gameplay along with it, it really could have been special. 
Sega yanked this one on Disney's request because they didn't want anything using the Fantasia license. That didn't help its appeal any, and it remains one of Sega's most epic 16-bit disappointments. Time Killers was originally an arcade game that got a late in life port to the Genesis in 1996. Having heard about its dubious quality, I avoided it and stuck to my Saturn and PlayStation games. Many years later, I sat down to finally play it, and good lord were the reviews of the time accurate. This is truly a bad fighting game, perhaps even worse than Rise of the Robots by a good measure. The graphics are genuinely no better than a Master System title, and the sound is considerably worse. Gameplay amounts to little more than hopping back and forth, looking for that one move that connects 80% of the time so you can survive the otherwise horrific mechanics. I have always felt that bad games rarely live up to their mythic billing, but Time Killers definitely earns its criticism and then some. It sits among the worst on the Genesis, easily giving Slaughter Sport, Sword of Sodan, and Dark Castle a run for their money. I'm sure some of you found some delight in its blood and gore, and I'm sure the developer Black Pearl Software thought it'd be enough to sell a few copies. But relying on such an incredibly weak gimmick to sell a poorly developed piece of software almost always ends badly. This one was no exception. <laughs> As someone who admired the late Robin Williams, it hurts me to add this one to the list, but Toys was just an awful game on the Genesis. Released in 1993 and based on the film of the same name, you are a toy maker out to stop your uncle from turning your products into weapons of war. Played from an overhead perspective, the entire game is basically you wandering around looking for cameras to smash. Of course, wandering around with no ability to jump or do much of anything other than use your crappy weapons, which are mostly out of your direct control, quickly grows tiresome. But it's the cluttered enemies and constant barrage of weapon fire that takes this one to new extremes of tedium. Hits come from nowhere and many of them you can't see coming. Because your own attacks lack any real effectiveness or fun factor, you are basically running for your life in every stage. There are supposed to be side-scrolling levels later on, but I've never seen them because I grow tired of this unbelievably fast. Once you top on the bland graphics and awful gems music and sound effects, it's one you'll want to skip, even if you love the original Robin Williams performance. Sometimes a game just seems to hit all the right areas for being a must-own. When Sega published Instruments of Chaos starring young Indiana Jones in 1993, I had visions of a Castlevania-like execution with bold, beautiful graphics and a soundtrack worthy of the movies. Somebody should have been there to smack my dumbass back down to reality, because we of course got nothing of the kind. There isn't anything here to put in the plus column. The animation is funky, the gameplay is slow and unresponsive, and it sounds like someone is dropping a deuce while you're playing it. Because I love the license so, I tried to like it. I really did. This wasn't a game I simply turned off after the first level and said to hell with it. I gave it my all, but the absurdity of the gameplay wore heavy to the point of hatred. There are enemies you can shoot a hundred times and not kill. There are platforms you can fall through and die. The animation is so laggy it causes attacks and jumps to come out half a second after you press the button. Replaying this here for the capture reminded me of all the reasons why I came to hate this back then. It's a poor effort start to finish, and a game I can honestly say has nothing redeeming about it. Sega publishing stuff like this was a detriment to the Genesis brand, and a reminder that Western software could be truly awful in the 90s. Now 
Not being a fan of Aerosmith, I suppose I was biased against Revolution X from the beginning. The thing is, the arcade game did have its merits. Two-player co-op gunplay with some nifty sprite scaling was enough to earn it some respect, but the Genesis version here has little of the arcade's appeal. The sound and visuals are cut back to the point of being a completely different game. Gone are the scaling environments, replaced with side-scrolling levels that repeat to the point of wanting to turn it off after 10 minutes or so. And that really is where the game falters the worst. The repetition is just unreal. Shooting the same bad guys that take too long to kill while you take mandatory damage just isn't fun. The arcade version was pay to win too, but you expect a bit more in substance from a home game. Take away the sound and visuals though, and what's left here is nothing worth playing on your laziest day. Acclaim was again involved in this mess, and it should come as no surprise to many of you. This was late 1995, and the Genesis had many better games for you to play. Some games you just want to be good because of the pedigree of the other games in the series. When Robocop 3 showed up in 1993, it kind of reminded me of the original arcade game in the ads, so I was hoping for the best. No such luck with this one. While it remains a simple run and gun with some platforming elements, the simple graphics and horrendous enemy design really punish any chance of you enjoying it. Enemies are of the touch you in your damaged variety and even go a step further by continuing taking life if you don't move fast enough. Most of the challenge is simply surviving the onslaught of enemies at the end of the stages. Battles that can often end as quickly as they start unless you have lightning fast fingers or a turbo controller. You'll also be terrorized by off-screen damage here repeatedly, a frustration that gets worse as the game gets harder. Robocop can die by falling too if you can believe it, despite him taking a dive off the OCP building in the second movie. This is just too slow, too cheap, and too ugly to do the license any real justice. If you want a proper Robocop video game on the Genesis, fire up Robocop vs. Terminator and have a blast. As it stands here, only the Matt Furnace soundtrack is worth a damn. Every video game has a certain level of repetition. It's unavoidable, and it's the gameplay hook and how well it's executed that tempers that repetition to enjoyable levels. But 1992's Toxic Crusaders wallows in its repetition to the point where you are just begging for the stages to finally end. It's a beat-em-up, but the tiny 4 megabit cartridge was used poorly, resulting in seeing the same enemies constantly and some pretty uninspired graphics and sound. You have a choice of a few different characters to use, but they all amount to the same end result in combat. And man, is that combat super cheap. You can be juggled for multiple hits resulting in crazy damage. Stuff is constantly falling on you, crushing you, or flying around you, pelting you with damage. The gameplay isn't tight enough to deal with it all, and you spend most of your time running from enemies as opposed to mounting an effective offense. The Master System visuals and gem soundtrack add insult to injury, yet somehow Sega of America found it within their judgment to publish it. Some of the folks involved in this were also the ones that did Fantasia, making it no surprise at all to veterans that suffered its gameplay. When I began to explore the Mega Drive's library from other regions of the world, I was excited to find the PAL exclusive Yogi Bear cartoon capers. Many of these types of platformers had been at the very least decent experiences, and some, like Castle of Illusion, had been an outright blast. I wouldn't discover this one until well after the demise of the platform, but even then I was shocked at just how bad it was. Janky scrolling, bad hit detection, and some truly boring gameplay really hammer the fun factor here. It's a real shame too because the graphics and animation are actually not bad at all. But that's the only positive here. 
Every stage is about collecting the same three things endlessly, with little variation other than the stage visuals. I know it's for kids and it is easy once you get the feel for things, but this fails on every level to hold your attention. It was published by Game Tech in 1994 and developed by Blue Turtle, a company I honestly know nothing about. Funnily enough, even the Sega-loving Euromags at the time crushed it in their reviews. And if you know anything about Europe, when a Sega magazine had some bad things to say, you knew to keep as far away as possible. Playing it today reaffirms my dislike for this. Your kids may enjoy it, but Yogi Bear is otherwise a huge misfire. As an NES kid, I never cared much for Alex Kidd in Miracle World. It was okay, but not something I'd play seriously for any length of time. But good god did I despise the 1989 Genesis release, Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle. This was a launch title in North America, and man was I shocked by its pathetic visuals and laughable gameplay. Your attack feels so ineffective, your jump is so slow and floaty, but Sega also kept up the rock-paper-scissors nonsense, which basically leaves winning to chance instead of skill. I know Sega didn't want to stray too far from the original because it was so popular in Europe, but this should have been so much better. Reviews were all over the place for this. Some liked it, some thought it was okay, and some hated it. I'm in the camp of the latter full force. Sega knew what they had here as it was one of the cheaper games released at the time, coming in under $50 while most Genesis launch games were $5 to $10 more. Alex Kidd lovers likely found enough here to enjoy, but for most everyone else, this 2 megabit letdown didn't show an ounce of what the platform was capable of. In early 1990, Sega released Zoom, a grid-based single-screen action title that was a port of an original Amiga game. The goal here is to take your little dude and outline all the squares on the game board. Yep, that's it. You can jump and there are items you can get for points, invincibility, and freezing your enemies in place. It puts you in mind of kicks, but here you must circle every single square. While the gameplay itself isn't awful, it gets boring pretty fast, and after a few minutes, you have seen all this has to offer. But what really made me hate this was the main character saying the same damn thing over and over. Come on boy, come on boy, come on boy. I mean, he drones this out regularly and it gets really irritating after a while. This was another 2 megabit release that was under $50, Sega's early attempt at a budget line. If it weren't for the voice sounding off come on boy constantly, I probably would just tell you it's a simple game and leave it at that. Unfortunately, the developers decided to hammer your ears with a repeated phrase that really grates on your nerves. Gaming magazines tended to agree with me on this one and the reviews were not kind. It has its fans, but I am certainly not one of them. I wanted to love 1991's Technocop so much. I mean, it seemingly had everything. Driving segments, exploration, blood and guts, all the things a growing boy needed for entertainment. But somehow, the folks at Razorsoft and Punk Development managed to ruin it with some awful gameplay. It starts with the driving segments. You have to press up for gas and down for your brake, an interface that was usually reserved for computer games at the time not consoles with plenty of buttons to do both on their controllers. Then the side-scrolling shooting segments start up. 
It's true the enemies blow up real good, but everything around that sucks to high heaven. Your jump is awkward, there is a horrible lag in your shots, and you're at the mercy of a damn timer. You also lose half the screen to a giant computer console on your arm that really serves no purpose that a much simpler heads-up display could have done. Things just never come together for this one and it ends up being more frustrating than anything else. I should have heeded the warnings of the game magazines, because they all pretty much trashed it in their reviews. Growing up with a father that loved muscle cars and motorcycles, I got to indulge in his hobbies quite a bit. I became fond of mini bikes and four-wheelers, so when I saw Namco's Quad Challenge in 1991, I was all for it. What I was met with was a nasty permanent screen presentation that was slow, lacking detail, and just plain disappointing. Namco's typically solid track record took a huge blow with me over this. By late 1991, the Genesis was really hitting its stride and quality releases were landing left and right. I was blindsided by this turd though. I had read some pretty positive reviews. I had wanted it to be good so bad, but didn't stop to think that maybe I should wait for a rental. Instead, I pulled the trigger and ended up with something with next to no trade-in value and a group of friends that wanted nothing to do with it. Nothing saved it either. It wasn't fun in multiplayer, and the visuals all looked the same, except for a few new background tiles here and there. Namco didn't crap the bed often, but they sure did with this one. In 1992, I was privy to one of the worst games ever released on the Genesis, Renovation and Telnet Japan's Beast Wrestler. This isometric atrocity is a wrestling game in name only. It's rarely little more than a bear hug and choking simulator that controls terribly. I never feel like my on-screen counterpart is doing what I'm telling them, and getting knocked down results in being stunned for much longer than it should be. It seems the developers focused all their skill and time on making the monsters look good, and very little on making them control and play well. I want to like it, heck I want to love it to be honest, but there is little here to deserve your time. Lord knows I still didn't trust gaming reviews even then, but this one was universally panned and I should have listened. If you want to have some fun with some giant creatures, fire up King of the Monsters, it plays so much better. This one is gonna piss off some of you, but Toki Goin Ape Spit is a game I can't stand. Released in 1992 and published by Sega themselves, this is inspired by the arcade game of the same name by Tad Corporation. It's a horizontal and vertically scrolling walking gun starring Toki, a man turned into an ape who is trying to save his woman from the evil Dr. Stark. You can get different power-ups like three-way shots, power blast, and of course things like invincibility and extra lives. There's a bunch more stages here than in the original arcade too, leading you to believe it's quite worth playing. I thought so too at first, but after a few stages the slow gameplay and one hit deaths really start to weigh heavy on your patience. And it isn't just because it's difficult, it's the way your deaths unfold. Because you are so incredibly slow I never feel like you can move fast enough to avoid all the enemies and environmental dangers. You can play it to death and learn where everything is going to pop out, but that means loads of time investment in dying. A lot. You can get a shoe power up that speeds things up a bit, but it still never feels as fast as it should be. And while the backgrounds are quite nifty, the main character is just goofy looking as hell. 
His animation is silly and the sprite is just unappealing in its design. I know many love it, but the slow movement combined with the one-hit deaths just turned me away forever. Reviews tended to favor it though, so I might be the odd man out on this one. You may have noticed that I'm mixing in magazine reviews in this episode. I wanted to do that to show you how sometimes their opinions were in line with yours and sometimes not. It was definitely the latter with 1992's pro quarterback from Trade West. A big fan of the NFL myself, I was really excited to play it after reading some fairly glowing reviews. In pictures it looked great, but my god was I blown away by this turd once I played it. This has got to be the worst running sports game on the platform. The control is absolutely destroyed thanks to the 3 frames per second visuals. No joke, just look how bad this thing runs. From there it has no official license for the teams or the league, so there is no appeal there at all. I know old sports games don't get much love in the retro community these days, but many of them still play great. This definitely ain't one of them however. It makes Madden look like the best thing ever in comparison. Every so often I have to laugh at the game design that came out of the PAL territories in the 80s and 90s. It's often characterized by stuff falling on your head, and damn does Tom and Jerry frantic antics embody that style and then some. Aside from the gameplay being stiff and rather difficult, there is always something falling on you. Tom and Jerry do get some projectile weapons here and there to help out, but your enemies aren't the real danger here. I really like the visuals of this one, but the gameplay is just terrible. It's exhausting keeping up with all the stuff in the environment that can hurt you. Every jump, every movement of the screen, every step of the way reveals something coming out of nowhere, usually just off the screen, to cause you damage. This becomes a painful exercise of seeing how long you can tolerate bad game design. I didn't care for the Master System Tom and Jerry game either, but this makes that look like a masterpiece in comparison. In fact, it's another one most of the Euro Sega mags ripped apart in its release. It's not bad to look at, but its positives begin and end right there. Have you ever encountered a game that just makes no sense at all? Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures was one such game for me. Released in 1994 by Namco, I didn't know what to expect with this one. The media reviews I encountered had been fairly positive, and it looked good in pictures. And there it did not disappoint at all. Graphically, this is a really impressive title. Color, animation, detail, it all jumps off the screen as one of the more impressive games Namco developed back then. But the gameplay here is just bizarre. You don't directly control Pac-Man. Instead, you must use your slingshot to suggest actions to him. I applaud Namco for trying something new with an old franchise, but in practice, this is a ferociously irritating game to play. Pac-Man rarely listens to your input, and the gameplay often depends on you just randomly shooting things until you find what you need to move Pac-Man to the next area. Action sequences are even worse because they are basically escort missions keeping Pac-Man out of danger. This worthless bastard can't do anything on his own, and the smallest mistake leads to a death. I honestly don't know who this is for. Kids, maybe? Newcomers who didn't know the previous games? For those of us that grew up with Pac-Man, it's painful to see him reduced to such a worthless prop that has to be babysat the entire way. It may look great, but it's such a chore to play, I can't imagine how anyone could have enjoyed this.
The dictionary defines the word bad as of poor or inferior quality, defective, deficient, and I certainly feel all of these games apply. While I have no doubt that some of you likely played enough of these to find some kind of enjoyment in them, I unfortunately cannot say the same. I've always been the kind of guy that has believed that if a video game doesn't sit right with you when you first play it, you don't know that game any more of your time. It doesn't matter if it gets better later on or improves with you becoming more acclimated with its mechanics. If it doesn't appeal to you, that's just the way it is. Some games immediately put you off by the way it looks or sounds, and sometimes the gameplay just doesn't feel right. Conversely, I do happen to believe that there is no such thing as an objectively bad game. Someone somewhere has enjoyed even the most hated video games and held them in high regard. You can boil it down to taste or personal opinion if you want, but art has a strange way of manipulating us in all sorts of directions. You can take two gamers who like mostly the same stuff, only to have them disagree sternly on the sound, graphics, and gameplay of a hotly contested piece of software. I think that really makes episodes like this interesting. For me, I lay my soul bare telling you how much I dislike these games. I mean, I wouldn't piss on any of these if they were on fire, but I also really enjoy seeing the comments from those of you that have radically different opinions. I've always kind of loved that about video game related entertainment. Seeing opinions that reinforce my own is cool and all, but it's hearing from those of you that go in a completely different direction that's truly interesting. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.